event through online uh, platform. And let us pray to our Almighty with His blessing. This event is smoothly run and all of us keep safe and healthy. Thank you for your kind attention. Uh, Bilahi Taufik Wa Hidayah. Wassalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Thank you. I give back to the master ceremony, Saf Safa. Thank you very much, Dr. Riyati, for the amazing opening speech. Uh, so now we will continue our main agenda, which is the lecture. But before that, let me introduce our amazing moderator, Kak Marentina Grace. Kak Marentina, the time is yours. Okay, thank you, Shiva. Uh, good morning, everyone. Good evening, Dr. Parkman. Um, so before we proceed to our lecture this morning, I'd like to share some sort of introductions of our guest lecture today. Uh, I'm going to deliver to you uh, Dr. Parkman uh, CV. Please, Yava, can you help me? Or the host. Uh, so our guest lecturer today is Dr. Michael Leo Parkman. Uh, he is a senior investigator and already has a, more than 25 years of experience as a clinician and medical educator. So our, uh, Dr. Parkman graduated from University of Texas School of Public Health in Houston. Uh, and currently uh, he is working as a senior investigator in Kaiser Permanente Washington Health Research Institute, and also work as an affiliate professor uh, in Department of Family Medicine and also Department of Health Service in School of Medicine and School of Public Health of University of Washington. Uh, as I made a review last night, uh, Dr. Parkman uh, has hundreds of publication, but the recent publication, as you can see in the screen, uh, we made there about four or five. Um, so I think now we can start our uh, lecture today. And I think to avoid any distractions or uh, any, any, any kind of disturbing condition, I suggest to all of participants to uh, mute your mic, but in, in fact of uh, maybe you have a question before our question and answer session, you can type down your question in our chat room. It can be in English or in Indonesia. If it's in English, it's, it's good, but if it's in Indonesia, I'll try to help you to translate it and deliver it to Dr. Parkman. So, Dr. Parkman, I, I think we can start our uh, lectures today. So, time and screen is yours. Thank you. Thank you so much. Can you all hear me? Yeah, very clear. Okay, I'm gonna start sharing my screen. So I wanna make sure that you can see my screen too. Is that okay? Yep, <clears throat> perfect. Great. Well, thank you. Thank you so much. It is such an honor for me to be here with you today. Um, I am very um, humbled. Um, I approach this with a spirit of humility. Um, and as I prepared my talk uh, for you today, um, it made me realize um, how little I understand um, 
about your context um, and where you work um, and about the way care is delivered um, where you live. Um, and so what I bring to you today is um, sort of my understanding of how we think about this topic here in my country. I do not know how this is going to translate um, into the implications for this in your setting and especially um, your role as nurses um, in your country. Um, and so I just want to um, say it up front that um, um, I need to learn from you about uh, your challenges and the context and the setting that you deliver care. And I encourage you to enter questions into chat um, and to interrupt me as we go. Um, um, and uh, I appreciate very much your offer to translate for me if you need to enter the question um, um, in Indonesia or another language besides English. Um, just, just feel free to interrupt me. Um, is I, I'm going to mispronounce it. Is it is it Merinta? Merinta? Merintina? Merintina. 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 You can call me Mai. Mai, please interrupt yeah. me. Please interrupt me <laughs> okay, as I'm okay. talking, okay? <laughs> because I really want this to be um, a conversation and not just okay. me talking the whole time. All right. And I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to stop at several points and ask if people have questions <clears throat> as we go. Um, so thank you for the opportunity um, to talk with you today about this very important uh, uh, subject. Um, so um, the, the title is, is Nurses Bridging the Gap um, Between Acute Hospitals and, and Community Healthcare Centers. <clears throat> And so I had to, I had to look up online in Indonesia. What does it mean when you say community health center? Um, and I had to learn a little bit about the way you think about um, delivering healthcare um, in your country and about how the hospital systems are organized. And the the provincial government now the provincial government um, has has some say in 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 the way hospitals are run. But it's unclear to me about the linkage between the acute hospital and the community healthcare center. What, what is currently in place in Indonesia? I don't know. I don't know how that works. So all I can bring to you is my perspective on how we think about it here in the United States. Um, and I wanna share with you some of, those, some of those ideas and insights today. So it always helps if we're talking about understanding each other to start with definitions. Um, what are the words we use and what do the words we use mean? when we talk with each other. And the first term I want to talk with you about <clears throat> is care coordination. Um, and here in the United States, this is a commonly accepted definition of Dr. what we- Dr. Parkman, I'm sorry to interrupt you, but uh, some of the audience can see uh, the slide full screen. Uh, oh. Yep. Uh, Let's see if I know how to do this. Let's see if I can go to I presenter view there. Is that better? Yep, this one is perfect. There, how was that? Yep, perfect, Even better. sir. <laughs> yeah. Thank you, thank you, thank you for for that, for, for, for that interruption, I very much appreciate it. Um, so this is a common definition here in the United States of care coordination. Um, it involves deliberately organizing patient care activities and sharing information among everyone who's involved with patient's care. And the goal is to achieve safer care and more effective care. Um, it, never, it never works out well when, um, as we say, there's a common English expression, the right hand does not know what the left hand is doing, <laughs> is, not a good, is not a good thing. So coordination involves not only sharing information, but also having a conversation and organizing care activities together 
so that we're achieving the safest and most effective care for a patient. And that can be among uh, physicians, nurses, physical therapists, social workers, pharmacists, laboratory technicians, um, surgeons, hospitalists, um, everyone who touches a patient um, can be involved in this. I don't know if you have community healthcare workers or promotoras, um, anybody who touches a patient so that we're all communicating with each other and sharing information in a way that we can coordinate our, our, our activities. Because what I do as a, as a clinician with my patient can influence your activity with the patient as a nurse. <clears throat> and we need to be on the same page. There's another term we use called care transitions. Um, and we define that as when patients move between different settings for their care. And in this case, we're talking about the acute hospital setting and the community health center setting. Um, so there's a transition there between one setting and another setting that requires that we pay particular attention to things like care coordination um, um, and continuity of, of care for our patients. Um, and I put a quote on this slide. I've heard this many times from my patients in the hospital. Uh, they say to me, I have seen so many doctors during my stay in this hospital. I don't know who is in charge or who I should follow up with when I go home. Um, and so that's a problem with the care transition um, uh, process. <clears throat> There's another term we use here in the United States called care management. Care management are interventions that are specifically used to improve that transition from one setting to another. So it's a set of actions designed to ensure that that coordination and continuity of care is passed from one hand to the next hand. So on the one hand, it's the acute hospital setting, and the other hand, it's the community health center setting. How do we make sure that the transfer of that care occurs seamlessly and without any errors or problems um, or difficulties and try to anticipate where there might be problems and proactively prevent those problems from happening during the, the transition process. And so that's what, what we mean when we say care transition, I mean, care management um, activities. And we'll come back to this term here in just a minute um, and what we think of when we say care management um, here in, in our country here. <clears throat> um, when you define what, an ideal situation should be when you have a care transition. Um, there are, there's a consensus in our country about what a care transition should be. Um, and this actually, actually is, is taken out of a different um, report that was written in our country about um, um, what healthcare should look like in our country. But when you, when you, when you have a care transition, you wanna make sure that, that the, the care they receive during that transition, transition is timely, that it's safe, it's planned and managed to prevent anything um, bad from happening to the patient. Um, you wanna make sure that what you do has some evidence behind it. Um, and the goal is to maximize patient benefit you wanna make sure that you're not duplicating your efforts, that it's efficient, that no, you don't have the same people doing the same activities over and over again for the same patient. Um, <clears throat> there are situations that have arisen in our country where um, multiple, multiple people have taken on the role of trying to manage a patient's care. So for example, um, a patient who has um, congestive heart failure, um, in-stage renal disease, um, depression, and asthma might get a phone call from a care manager who's trying to manage each of those conditions, the heart failure, the renal disease, um, the depression, and the asthma. And 
the patient has no idea who's in charge. Um, and they get four different phone calls from four different people. And that is not efficient um, in terms of duplicating services during the care transition process. Um, it's really important that the care transition be responsive to what are the patient and the caregiver needs, right? So patients go home and oftentimes there's someone in the home who, who has to take care of the patient uh, while they are recovering um, from, from their stay in the hospital. That caregiver also needs to be included in the conversation about um, what are the needs of the patient and how can they be involved in making sure that that care transition um, occurs without any problems and, and the patient is receiving the care that they need and that they want. Um, and then finally, it needs to be equitable. Equitable means the, the care doesn't differ by personal characteristics of patients, such as um, their race, their ethnicity, their religious beliefs, whatever. It doesn't vary. Everybody deserves the same, um, the same quality and the same standard of care. Um, when they're going through this care transition process. So I just say all this all this to you as background, <clears throat> just to say, this is sort of an, in our country, what we talk about when we talk about um, care transitions. And now I'm gonna talk a little bit about um, this term care management again during transitions. Um, and this takes a little bit of explanation, um, but not much. Um, and it goes back to these terms I just talked about. So at the bottom, you can see care coordination, right? Um, and that's, that, that is the foundation of everything else that we've talked about. Um, so care coordination is, is foundational, but care management <clears throat> is something that is added on top, <clears throat> added on top of the care coordination. So care coordination is about the logistics of making sure that people are communicating with each other and that sh information is being shared and that we're not duplicating efforts, right? But, but care management gets into to clinical follow-up and then more intense care management activities. And what's, what's on the right-hand side of this page is, you know, 80% of patients who are discharged from the hospital probably only need care coordination and some clinical follow-up care, some logistical things like clinical monitoring of their status, monitoring their lab results, their blood pressure, those kinds of things. But there are 20% of patients who are more complex um, and who are gonna require more intense care management, such as support for their medication, uh, self-management support, education, and more intense clinical monitoring of their care. So we think of this as sort of a stair-step process of at the, basic, at the basic needs, everybody needs care coordination. So if I go to the hospital and I'm admitted and I get out of the hospital, someone needs to coordinate my follow-up care with my primary care clinician or my primary care team um, in the clinic. And so I need an appointment. They need to make sure I have the appointment. They need to make sure that I know how to get to the clinic. That's care coordination. Clinical follow-up is like saying, okay, before you come back to the clinic for your follow-up visit, we need you to go in two days beforehand and get this lab test done so that when you go this, to the clinic for your follow-up visit, we know what the results of your lab test are to see if you're still improving after your hospital stay. So that's, that's more clinical monitoring. And again, it's logistical in nature. You have to plan for that. But care management is that a more intense service of saying, some people are gonna need more support with making sure that they are on the right medicines, when they go home from the hospital, that they know what medicines they're supposed to be taking, that they know what self-care activities are in terms of things like wound care or um, um, their treatments for their asthma, say their asthma inhalers, um, and, and following the diet in terms of activities, what kind of physical activities can they do the first week they go home? So that's more self-management support activities. And that's the way we think of it as sort of a tiered approach um, to, to managing care transitions. Let me stop there and just ask if, if anyone has any questions before I go any further, because I know this is this this can be um, challenging <laughs> to understand.
I think there's no question yet, sir. Okay. <clears throat> okay, if don't ask. You want to ask? You can ask some question, please. Uh, my engineer, I think I want to ask questions. Okay. Uh, Please, Dr. Evie. Michael, this is Evie. Um, uh, I would like to know: Do the uh, health workers, I, whether it's I'm doctor sure or nurses, do they communicate? Those who are working in the hospital, do they communicate with those who are working at the community settings? institution like here we have a hospital and we have public health centers but there is no communication in between there is no mm -hmm. for example if i send my patient home to the community health center uh, uh, back to their homes i could there is no such a like a framework or uh like a, like a link that i can access to call up the uh, nurses in community health centers. Um, do, in your country, uh, is there anything such like a link between hospital and the community? Is there, is there is like a forum or I don't know, like a WhatsApp group or mm -hmm. something? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yes, there is. And um, really over the last uh, 15 to 20 years, there's been a lot of investment in that. Um, and what happened in our country, the history or the story behind that um, is that um, um, the health insurance that is the largest health insurance program in our country is for people who are older, people who are 65 years of age and older. And those are the people who most likely end up in the hospital. Of course, as you get older, you have more chronic conditions, you are more likely to need hospital care. That health insurance program <clears throat> created a financial penalty for hospitals when patients were discharged, if they were readmitted to the hospital within 30 days, those hospitals had to pay for their care. So they, there was a financial penalty for not doing good care transitions. And we know that if you don't have an effective care transition program in place, Patients are more likely to be readmitted to the hospital within 30 days after their discharge. So, <clears throat> so that really got the attention because there was a lot of money at, in, at stake um, here for the hospitals. And they began developing programs to make sure that patients were being transitioned back to the community health center and that there was a linkage between the hospital and the primary care clinic team. And I'm going to go into that in just a minute and give you two examples of how that works. Um, so that's a that's a really good question. Um, and and uh, these are just two two examples out of many, but we can go into other exp other examples as well if that's helpful. Sir, there's a question in the chat room. Mm -hmm. Uh, it's from Regita Galuh Parvati. Uh, her question is, what ways of learning can improve our skills mm. to be quick thinkers when the care transitions is interrupted by the patient? Can I ask a question? Okay, I'll repeat it again. No, 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 um, no, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. No, I, I'm asking, I don't understand the question. How, how is the care transition interrupted by the patient? Can you give me an example? Um, maybe what she means is, uh, if anyhow our program is, uh, we implement to the patient, but somehow the patient is, uh, doesn't care or doesn't want to, to, oh. mm -hmm. to follow the rules. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. uh, she asked mm -hmm. about how the way or what ways we, uh, of learning can improve our skills to take care of that problem. Right, that's a good question. That's an excellent question. Um, there are a number of, um, you know, I'm gonna answer that question during the presentation. That's a great question. Can we, can we hold off on answering that question? Um, okay, sure. 
So, uh, so I, oh, I see. I see complex issues like chronic disease, poverty, unemployed. Poor. Yes, 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 yes. I understand the question, and we're going to get. We're going to. Thank you. That's a great question, and we're going to answer that question um, okay. later in the presentation. Thank you for that. Okay. So. See if I can get my slides to the answer. There we go. So I don't understand, and let me ask you. Um, there are nurses in the hospital in your country. Are there also nurses in the community health center? Yes. 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 Mm -hmm. Okay. Okay. And in the community health center, what is the role of the nurse? What What are their responsibilities? What kind of what, what do they normally do? Uh, it's more likely about doing some assessment when mm -hmm. the patient come to the uh, health centers and mm -hmm. when they when they they are done with uh, the assessment, uh, they report it to the doctors and if anyhow uh, the patients need uh, a higher a higher possibility to go to the hospital and then they will repair it. But somehow they also do uh, some health management. Uh, uh, it's more like educate uh, the people around the, the healthcare community center. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That's great. That's great. That's really helpful. Thank you. Um, and that fits in very well with what I'm about to share with you about how we how we view this in, in this country, because in our country, the care transition process um, and the answers that we've, we've come up with have, have the nurse at the center, at the heart of every successful care transition program. Um, and it requires that there be a, a, some trust and relationship between the nurse who's working in the hospital uh, with the patient and is preparing the patient to be discharged from the hospital and a relationship between that nurse and the nurse in the community health center where the patient is supposed to follow up so that there's sh shared responsibility and accountability for that transition process between the nurse in the hospital and the nurse in the, in the health center, that there's information, standard ways of sharing information about the, the patient's healthcare needs and, and what the nursing care plan is for the transition because, because there's there's interdependence. So for the community health center nurse to do their job well, the acute hospital nurse has to do their job well. And for the acute, acute care hospital nurse to have success in discharging the patient, they depend on the community health center nurse to, to take up the responsibility for ensuring that that patient um, is transitioned successfully to the community health center. Um, so how does that happen? This is a photo of two phones. You can see two phones here sitting next to you. This is the old, the old time way of doing it. And in fact, that's the way care transition programs started in this country is that there was a discharged nurse in the hospital um, who was responsible. They, 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 they assigned a nurse in every hospital ward with the responsibility of having a list of all the patients who are going to be discharged home that day. Each patient before that day of discharge, they entered into the hospital record what community health center that patient is supposed to be followed up in. And they had a name and a phone number of a nurse in that community health center that they could call. And they would call that community health center and that phone, and they would talk to that nurse in that community health center and say, today, we are discharging this patient from our hospital. He's a 63-year-old male who is recovering from a stroke. 
He's been in the hospital for two weeks. His recovery has been partial but not complete. He's on these medications. He needs to have these lab tests done before he comes back in to see you. And we're arranging for him to go to the lab to get those tests done before he comes back to see you. Can you tell me what day and what time he should come back to the clinic to see you? The nurse who's on the phone in the community health center would say, let me look at the schedule and I will tell you what day and time we can see him. And she would share that information with the acute hospital nurse who would record that in the patient's record and say, I've discussed this patient with Rosalie um, Santiago at the community health center at so-and-so address. I've shared this information with her. She told me that the patient can come in on Tuesday, September 23rd at 10 a.m. for a follow-up appointment. And I have given that information to this patient um, before they go home. So that's how it used to be done in this country originally. That was the, that was the way that things were done. And every hospital had a list of all the clinics um, in their area that patients were, 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 were going, going out to see. And that's how that information was shared. Now, now the nurse in the community health center <clears throat> would record this information <clears throat> on the appointment schedule and say, this patient has an appointment on this day. We enter the name of the patient and say the reason for the visit is hospital follow-up. And then they would create a, a record for that patient. If the patient had a medical chart, they would, they would make, they would enter that into the medical record or the medical chart. Um, <clears throat> if, if they didn't, they would create a new medical chart for the patient and enter that inf information into the medical record so that when the patient showed up for, for the, for the follow-up visit, they had that information. Now, we didn't have electronic health records back then. So a lot of this was paper and pencil and phone calls. And people were leaving the hospital with paperwork and they were told, you take this paperwork to the community health center because this is what the doctor and the nurses in that community health center need for your follow visit. Sometimes that got lost between the hospital and the community health center. So then what they began doing is faxing that information from the hospital to community health center when the patient was discharged. So the community health center had a fax with the discharge paperwork that had the patient's name, their diagnoses, their medications, and what tests or what follow-up care that was, was needed for that patient. And they developed a standard form to do that. Well, since we now all have electronic health records, we're, we're, we've We've worked at developing ways to communicate that information um, through, our, through our electronic record systems. Even though we may not be on the same electronic health record, we now have what we call data exchanges where we can share that information in the patients. Does that make sense? Yeah, uh, I think so. Maybe there's the big difference between the USA and Indonesia. Um, because in Indonesia, there's no, there's no such as link between the hospital nurses and in the community health center nurses. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. So maybe this is a new information to, uh, to us as Indonesian. And excuse me, sir, can I translate this to, to my friends and the participant here? Please, please. Okay. Uh, jadi, kalau di US itu, Uh, nyambung dari pertanyaannya Miss Evi tadi, mereka punya punya hubungan yang baik antara perawat di rumah sakit dengan perawat di uh, kayak di kita puskesmas gitu. Jadi ketika ada seseorang yang masuk ke rumah sakit, terus uh, dia selesai perawatan di rumah sakit, nanti uh, mereka bakalan follow up ke yang di puskesmas gitu. Dan semua informasi tentang uh, biodata, diagnosa, riwayat penyakit itu Uh, puskesmas tahu apa yang dilakukan di rumah sakit itu puskesmas tahu dan seandainya uh, pasien ini harus melakukan follow up nanti kemudian ke ke rumah sakit uh, puskesmas itu follow upnya tuh bisa langsung ke rumah sakit dan mereka harus tahu gitu jadi uh, nanti orangnya datang ke rumah sakit tuh nggak nggak bingung aku harus gimana gitu uh, jadi mungkin itu bedanya ya kalau di Indonesia kan kita biasanya untuk follow up itu Uh, urusan antara pasiennya dengan uh, rumah sakitnya sendiri. Most of the time, I I see that 
kind of cases. Jadi uh, kalau di sana baiknya ya begitu. Jadi ada follow up yang baik antara rumah sakit dengan puskesmas. Um, ya yeah, that's it. Maybe that's the reason Mary, why. Mary Tina, uh, can I add something? Yeah. So Dr. Michael, um, so I just want to share the information how it works in Indonesia. Uh, mm-hmm. So usually when patient, patients are discharged from the hospital, they will have the follow-up uh, appointment, but it is in outpatient unit. So they will come back to the hospital in outpatient yes. unit. Yes. Uh, but there is no such um, coordination between hospital uh calling the community health center that we have done this we have given the medicine such and such uh, so when they come home and there is no appointment again until they have again the symptoms they will come back to yes. the community health center to ask the medicine so we are focusing more in asking the medicines like to get the medicine they will come to the uh, community health center if they don't experience any symptoms or uh, illness they w- they won't go to the to the uh, community yes. health center yes i'm very familiar with that model when i went to medical school that was the model of care we had and we had an acute care hospital um, and when we discharged patients they came back to the outpatient clinic in the hospital for their follow-up visit um, and as a medical student i was oftentimes the doctor they would see in the outpatient clinic when they came back to the hospital Um, um, and the challenge, of course, with that is, as you know very well, um, is that let's say the patient was in the hospital for a stroke because they had um, high blood pressure, um, and when they come back to the outpatient clinic, I can confirm that they're on the blood the medicine for their blood pressure, um, but then there's a a problem because, as you know, in order to, to control blood pressure, you have to take the medication every day. It's not something you you can stop. <laughs> um, and so to make sure the patient continues taking that medication and understands their condition, the high blood pressure, and the fact that we can control it, but we can't cure it, they need follow-up in the community health center after that to make sure they're getting their medicine, their blood pressure checked, to make sure the medicine is working right, Um, that it's working effectively um, and that they continue getting the medicine refilled for their for their high blood pressure. Um, and that's that's another care transition. So they're transitioning from the the hospital's outpatient department where they came for their follow-up visit. And they're transitioning then to the community health center for continued care of their chronic disease. Um, and so any kind of care transition program, whether it be at the time of discharge from the hospital or care transition from the hospital outpatient department back to the community health center, there needs to be some sort of transition plan in place or a system, a support system in place to ensure that that transition happens and that patients get their, 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 their needs met. Um, and I completely understand this. I have, I have spent my life working in, um, Um, safety net hospitals, which are hospitals for the poor um, here in the United States, and we have a lot of them. Um, and a lot of patients that we take care of don't understand their conditions. Um, they don't think they need any more care. They don't like seeing doctors. They don't want to see a doctor. Um, and we struggle um, with, with, with working with them to do that. And I want to share some examples of some programs that have evidence behind them about how we do that. Is that okay? So because of this problem, there were two evidence-based programs that were developed and tested by two different people in two different places in our country. Um, and these programs were developed 15 years ago or more. Um, But I just want to point out that both of these care transition programs, nurses are at the center of both of these models of how you support the care transition from the hospital to the community health center. 
And let me walk you through each program and explain it to you. So Eric Coleman, um, I actually know Eric um, from a long time ago, um, developed a program where a nurse would meet the patient in the hospital and follow up using visits to their home and through phone calls for four weeks. And they would focus on four areas of support for that patient, managing their medication, scheduling and preparing for follow-up care in the community health center, having the patient recognize what are red flags or symptoms that indicate their condition is worsening and they should seek care early, and preparing patients to ask their clinician in the community health center questions about their condition so they understand it better or how to better take care of their condition themselves. So those are the four skill areas they worked with with patients. And there is um, um, uh, evidence behind this. So when they studied this program, they showed that the rate of readmission to the hospital over the next 30 days was reduced by 30%. Um, they cut healthcare costs by nearly 20% because by showing that, they could take that to their regional um, provincial healthcare system and say, we can save you money if you will give us funds for a, care, a nurse who can do this work. So it was cost effective to have a nurse who was doing, who was meeting the patient in the hospital and then following up with them through home visits and phone calls over four weeks. And they could show that they saved the health system money by doing that. Since then, there have been more than 700 healthcare systems here in the United States that have adopted this program. Um, and you can read more about it here on this link in this slide. And of course, I'll, I'll share these slides with you um, after, um, after we get through here today so you can read more about this program. Um, but it is, a, it is a free program because it was, I mean, the, the, you, there's no cost to, to buying this program. You don't have to purchase it because the program was developed with funding from our government. So it's, it's freely available for anyone. And there are guides you can follow about how you do this um, program. If you're a nurse and you want to learn how to implement this program, there are guides and, and resources to show you how to do this. The second program I want to mention is developed by a nurse. Mary Naylor, she is such a wonderful person. I had the opportunity to work with her and meet her a number of you about 10 or 12 years ago. Um, it's like all nurses, every nurse I meet, they're such wonderful people. They're just amazing people um, to work with. Her program focused on particularly on high-risk patients um, with, in this case, with heart failure. I think they included patients with stroke as well um, for this care transition program. But their program, again, um, had a, uh, a nursing training component to it. So they trained nurses about how do you teach patients and their family members how to better manage their care? How do you, how do you, how do you develop nursing skills to coordinate a follow-up care plan with the patient's community health center physician? And then how do you provide home visits and be available on the telephone anytime the patient needs to call you with a question or a problem? Um, and so there's a, there, again, Mary Naylor's Care Transition Program. You can find it, oh, I misspelled transition. I just noticed on the slide. Huh. Um, Mary Naylor's program, you can find, um, you, can, you can find it on the internet. Um, um, about how to do this program. Um, there are guides and, and, and books and training available for how to do this program as well. Um, again, it focuses on the nursing role and care transitions, um, but they reduce readmissions by 36% and they reduce hospital costs to the healthcare system by 39% um, through this. Um, so I wanna go back to Eric Coleman's because I think I forgot to point out the nurses who meet the patients in the hospital 
were nurses that were employed by the community health center, not by the hospital. The community health center hired a nurse who went to the hospital to meet the patients and develop a relationship with them and their family and then followed up on their care until they came back into the community health center. Mary Naylor's program, the nurses were in, were employed by the acute care hospital. So they worked for the acute care hospital. So it's two different approaches. In one case, the nurses worked, the home of the nurses for Eric Coleman's program was in the community health center. The home base for Mary Naylor's program were nurses who worked in the hospital, who were acute care nurses in the hospital. Does that make sense? So I'm gonna give you two examples of how people have used these two programs to improve care transitions. Maybe I should stop and see if anybody has questions. Dipersilahkan kalau ada yang mau tanya. Oh. Adakah? Wait. <clears throat> I think there's no question yet in the chat room, so you may continue. That's fine. Let's continue. So about 10 years ago, I was involved in um, a project um, where a team of us wanted to identify innovative primary care clinics. So these are community health centers in your country. And how do they, how do they improve the care they provide for their patients at their community health center? And specifically, um, how do they work together as a team in their community health center to do that? Are there any innovative practices with within their team, the people who work in the clinic, the healthcare team on how they care for their patients that we could learn from them. And we identified 30 community health centers in our country that we thought were really doing something innovative about the care for their patients. And we went and visited every one of these 30 sites. Now here's a map of our country. You can see where these clinical sites were. Every site, we spent three days at each site um, interviewing their leadership, the clinic administrator, the physicians. We interviewed the nurses. We talked to the patients. We collected tools and resources they were using. And, and one of the things we learned about this was that they are all innovating. They were all trying to figure out how to better use their, their team, their healthcare team in their community health center to improve the care transition process. And I wanna give you two examples from two of these sites about how they did that. So the first example, oh, or before I do that, <laughs> let me take a second. So what we found is that, um, whoop, what happened? Is that the community health center um, is a link between the hospital, it's a link then to community resources like education and transportation and food and job training. Um, they were linking patients to public health out in the community, infectious disease control, chronic disease prevention programs. They were linking patients to, to specialty, mental health care, physical therapy, dental care. They were linking patients to diagnostic services, but it all happened because at the heart of it was this community health center and this group of people in this community health center, nurses, um, physicians, um, what we call medical assistants, um, social workers, pharmacists, who all work together in the same building, in the same clinic building together to solve problems 
to make sure patients were getting the care they needed, including addressing things like poverty, food insecurity, transportation, job training, um, all those things. And finding, and then we go out and find resources in their community and link their patients to those resources too. Sorry about that. Dang. Dang. All right. Um, and then we go out in the community and identify resources they could link patients to um, as well. But they, they really focused on, one of the things I wanna share with you is two examples of how they focused on this linkage with their, their, their local hospital at the community also. So <clears throat> there's a role, like I said, for the hospital, the nurse in the hospital um, at the time of discharge. And these are some of the things that, some of the activities that a, a, a nurse in the hospital can do um, um, at the time of discharge. And we've talked a lot about this a little bit. And then we've talked a little bit about the role of a nurse in a, in a community health center um, as well, kind of activities they do. But let me give you example number one. Example number one is an example of um, a nurse, uh, I'm trying to get rid of my little bar up here so I can see, is an example of a nurse who, who leads a care management team within the community health center. So there's a nurse who has a team of people that meet that manages patients who are being discharged from the hospital to make sure that they are getting the care they need during the transition. The second example is an example of a, of a single nurse who is a, who is a case or a care manager for the transition process. They don't have a team. They are the person who's responsible for doing all the care transition management. So example number one, this is, and this is a real example. There was a, there was a clinic we visited here in the United States who did this. They had a, a nurse um, who led this team. Um, and you'll, you'll, look, you'll see this, and this, this might look familiar um, because it's the Eric Coleman model, the model that I just told you about from Eric Coleman at the University of Colorado. This team um, worked with um, patients to improve their self-management skill. They wanted to decrease hospitalizations, improve their quality of life. But <clears throat> they did it by using face-to-face -face visits and phone calls while before the patient came back in to the clinic, they were doing outreach to the patient before they even came back into the clinic and saying, the day after discharge from the hospital, they would pick up the phone and call the patient and say, Hey, we just heard you got sent home from the hospital yesterday. How are things going? What do you need? Do you have your medicines? Um, do you understand when to come back and see us? Oh yeah, your visit with us is next Wednesday at 10 a.m. We're looking forward to seeing you. Um, and they would identify and help overcome barriers to self-management as well. Say, oh, you don't have transportation to come see us. Let us see if we can arrange for someone to come pick you up so that you can come back into our clinic. Oh, you can't afford your, medic your medicines. Oh, let us see if we can find a medicine that's on the formulary that we can give you so you can afford the medicine. Um, because sometimes patients leave the hospital with a prescription for a medicine they can't afford. Um, so this was a team approach to this. Um, and here's an example of two teams of nurses that were meeting in two different health centers to do this work. Um, so these were the care transition teams that would meet and they would meet once a week um, and, and look at the patients that were being discharged that week and come up with a care plan for each one. Um, they would have a clinical pharmacist on their team. They would have medical assistants on their team, sometimes mental behavioral, mental behavioral health care on their team, and sometimes the clinic administrator because they would go to the clinic administrator and say, um, we need to change how we do this process. Can you support us in doing this? in our clinic. Um, this is a team meeting once a week to huddle about all the patients that are being discharged from the hospital that week. Um, they would present each patient to the team and say, we're gonna to talk today about uh, Mary Smith who was discharged from the hospital yesterday. She's 63 years old. She needs to come back in and see us next week. And here are the needs that are not being met in the meantime. And they would develop a care plan. And they would assign individuals on the team to, to, to take care of the needs of that patient. So for example, 
they would say, okay, this patient's coming back in to see us next week, but they need transportation. Okay, Rosa, you're going to identify transportation for the follow visit for this patient. Rosa would say, yes, I will do that. Okay, Antonio, you're supposed to call the family to check in on their medications and make sure the patient has enough medicine to last until they come back in to see us next week. Antonio would say, okay, I can do that. I can call and check and make sure they have their medications and they have enough medications before they come back in to see us next week. So, so that's the kind of active planning they were doing in the community health center. The nurse was leading this team to do this, uh, this work. Um, oops. Huh. Okay. Um, the, the second example at a different clinic here in the United States that we visited is they had a dedicated nurse full-time who was the care transition manager. That community health center nurse would get up every morning and the first thing they would do is go visit the hospital. And they would go see the patients in that hospital that were in their catchment area. They were patients that belonged to their community health center. They knew that those patients were assigned to them and they had the responsibility for their ongoing continuity of care as a primary care clinic. They would visit with every patient that they, they, they knew was in the hospital that day. Now, they had to work with the, the hospital to develop a list of those patients. So they had to work with the nurse in the hospital to say, can you tell me you know, who are the patients in your hospital today who you think might be coming back in to see us today in one week or might be discharged later this week. And they would actually go into the patient's room and visit with them and they'd introduce themselves and say, hi, my name is Rosa or my name is May. I am the nurse from the community health center in your neighborhood where we're going to see you after you get home from the hospital. I want to know what your questions are for me. How can we help you in making that transition? They would meet with the people planning the discharge in the hospital. They would make sure the patient had the appointment at their community health center. They would provide the patient with written information um, about the care plan. And then they would call patients after they were discharged because they already knew the patient and the family. And the patient and the family would say, Oh, hi, Rosa. Yes, we remember seeing you when we were in the hospital. Thank you for calling us. So they had a personal relationship with the patient and the family. That went a long way toward overcoming patient resistance about coming back in to the community health center after they got discharged from the hospital. Because Rosa could then say, oh, yes, remember we talked about this in the hospital and about how your stroke was because your blood pressure was too high. We need to make sure your blood pressure is controlled. Can you come back and see us next week? We want to make sure you have your medicines that you need. And if the patient didn't keep that visit, they not only knew who that patient was and had their phone number, they knew where they live. And they could go out and make a home visit and check their blood pressure in the home and then follow up with that patient and get them to come back into the clinic during the home visit. The key to this is that there was a relationship between this nurse care manager and the patient before they left the hospital. Um, and this is the Mary Naylor model of doing care transitions. But it required a nurse in the clinic that had the time and that was their job description. They had a job description that said, you are the care manager transition nurse. Your job description and your responsibility is to do only this every day. And that's what they did to make sure patients didn't, did not end up back in the hospital because they ran out of their medicine or they didn't know how to take care of themselves or something worse happened to the patient. So um, let me stop there and see if there are any questions about this. I think there is some of questions in the chat room, sir. Oh. Okay. Is, 
Is that okay if I'll read it? Or what could be done to form an integrated system, a call center, considering that the condition of the hospitals in an area of different quality, yes, even with human resources <laughs> facilities in it. Yeah, that's a very common problem. <laughs> you know, that's a health policy issue and that's a healthcare system issue. Um, and it requires that in some situations in our country, the nurses in a district or in a provincial region would lobby the, you know, what is in your country, the provincial health, I'm, I don't, I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna have the right terms here. I'm sorry, I'm not gonna use the right words. They would lobby the provincial health district um, leadership and say, here's our proposal for how we can do a better job of having an integrated system, like a call center in this case, um, to make sure that patients don't end up back in the hospital and costing you more money because the hospital is the most expensive resource you have. If we can keep patients out of the hospital, we can save you money. Here is our proposal for how we do that. To do that, you are gonna to need to provide us with some funding to do this. So, but as nurses, we know we can do this because we've seen it done. Nurses can do this. Um, but it sometimes takes some political influence to be able to convince people to invest in that, in that resource. Um, and you may need to show that you can do an evaluation of it and prove to the people who are providing the funding for that resource that it is indeed preventing people from ending up in the hospital and consuming resources that are scarce. It's a problem. <laughs> Every and and believe me, we don't have this solved in the United States. I'm 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 giving you a rosy picture. I'm giving you the I'm giving you the best of the best examples because there are places in the United States that don't have anything like what I've just described. A lot of places um, where the care is fragmented. There are no care transition plans. There are no nurses who can do this work. Um, I'm just giving you the best examples of this in our country, but we don't have this solved completely. We don't have a uniform system across our country of making sure that, that these kind of care transitions happen without, without any problem. But I'm just giving you some examples of, of, of how it could be done and how people have successfully done it in our country. Okay, jadi uh, sebenarnya sistemnya itu enggak enggak sepenuhnya sempurna gitu. Tapi apa yang barusan dideskripsikan oleh Dr. Michael tersebut uh, jadi salah satu contoh gimana caranya itu bisa disempurnakan seandainya akan diimplementasikan seperti itu. Um, There's another question up there, Dr. Michael. Mm -hmm. um, Why don't you read it to me? Okay, the question is from Nurur Rahman. Uh, he asks about solution to how to perform a good healthcare, especially in the chronic patients, uh, since uh, in his opinion in Indonesia, healthcare services are less compassionate toward chronic patients. Maybe you can describe about uh, example of in the USA. Mm. Um, so what, what I'm thinking you're referring to, and we still see this in our country too, um, is that um, there's a term we use called stigma applied to people with a chronic disease. And stigma means that we blame them for the chronic disease. Um, and we think less of them 
as a human being because they have a chronic disease. And that causes us to be less compassionate and less respectful uh, for these patients. Um, and that is, um, that is a, a problem in our country too. Um, but one of the things that has helped us in our country um, about this problem um, is educating, um, starting with nursing students and with medical students, educating them about um, the chronic care model that I discussed when I talked with you in April um, and saying that people with a chronic disease can have really good outcomes and live a very productive um, and, and successful quality of life. Um, I think what, what you will find as we found in our country is that as people begin living longer and longer in our country, more and more people were experiencing a chronic disease. And as they aged, as they got older, um, and it became increasingly obvious to us that if we didn't develop a better attitude and a better system about caring for chronic diseases, and that that as a as a nurse and as a clinician, um, we can we can feel good about the care we're providing, and it's rewarding. It's, it's, it's something that we enjoy. It's something that gives us satisfaction in our daily work. When we see people with a chronic disease get better and they, their quality of life improves, their function improves, they can, they can have more time with their family. Um, um, and, and they are in, incredibly grateful um, when they receive that care. It became a motivation for us to say, we can do this. We can do good chronic illness care in our country. And the chronic care model that I presented to you last time was a framework for saying, this is how we how, how chronic illness care should be done in this country. Um, it should be done in primary care. It should involve um, self-management support. It should involve um, um, good, good information systems that give us the clinical information we need to manage these patients. It should involve connecting patients to community resources. Um, it should involve changing the workflow in the clinics so that we're not just triaging acute illness all the time, um, but we are, we are moving our nursing care and our illness care toward workflows around chronic illness care. So how do we do a better job of taking care of people with hypertension or high blood pressure? What about diabetes? Can we track and monitor those? How well do we do as a clinic? How well do we do as a team in caring for these conditions? And learning how to educate patients and their families about their illness. Uh, and there, there are programs that we developed in this country around chronic disease, self-management, education. And we began teaching medical students and nursing students um, and even people who had graduated from medical school and nursing school, teaching them about, here's how you teach patients about managing their chronic disease. Here's what patients need to know. Here's how you do it. Um, and as we, it just became, gra it, it, it's taken us 25 years of work in our country um, to, get, to get to the point where we can say, yes, um, chronic illness care is what we do. And we are very proud, some of us are very proud that we do it very well. Um, and that 80% of our patients that we see have their blood pressure well controlled and they are not gonna have a stroke because we are doing a really good job of controlling their blood pressure. And that's something we can all be proud of. And we give awards to, to, to the community health centers that are doing really well and saying, you are a center of excellence. You are, you are doing so well with controlling your blood pressure and your patients that we are acknowledging you as a a, a, a exemplar clinic, a health exemplar health center um, in your region, and we're recognizing you for your work. Um, so it became sort of a, a, a value 
for us um, about chronic illness care. I don't know if I'm answering the question and maybe I'm going on too long. So is there another question that we need to respond to? There's another one, sir, in the chat room also. Mm -hmm. This is from Ms. Anissa Urikartika. Um, so uh, in our country, integrating families in chronic care management, especially education about the risk of chronic disease, uh, for them is still rarely done by our healthcare provider because uh, we're just focusing in uh, our duty as a caregiver. So although the risk of developing chronic disease is higher in those who have uh, parents or family uh, with chronic disease, uh, in your opinion, what effective strategies to increase their awareness? Or uh, can you tell us whether in America have the model to integrate their families in the care management? Yeah, so um, this is where nurses play a central role in our country. Um, so in many primary care clinics that I've worked in throughout my career, um, there is an individual in the clinic that is the nurse, the nurse clinic manager, the nurse care coordinator. And one of their roles is when I, as a physician, um, finish the visit with the patient. Um, they will go into the, 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 the room or the place where the visit is happening with the patient and their family, hopefully. And there will be educational material for them. They will have, they will have um, handouts and that are that are at the health literacy level of the patient. We've paid a lot of attention in this country to saying we need to have information available to patients that is understandable, that has very easy to understand language um, to educate them. We worked a lot on making sure that the, in, the, say if we give a patient a piece of paper that explains their condition, that the language we use is very simple and very easy to understand. Um, um, we have, um, nurses that are trained in how to do this education for patients and families. And we have entire courses in our nursing school about how do you talk to patients and families and educate them um, about their conditions? Um, and, and how do you do that well? So nursing communication skills um, to do that. Um, so, um, there are models. There are models of, of integrating families into care management. Most of those models are about um, about including families in setting goals for the patient. Most of those programs are about including families and making goals for the patient in terms of saying, and here's. Here are the goals for, for your family member in terms of the care. Um, here's what you can do as a family member to support um, your, your father or your mother um, in taking care of their condition. Um, here are the kind of practical things you can do. And we've developed resources and materials for, for you know, diabetes and, and hypertension and stroke and congestive heart failure and and end-stage renal disease or kidney disease um, that are very focused at, at the role of the family or the caregiver um, in supporting the patient. But the nurse, the nurse in the clinic is the one who does most, <laughs> who does the education um, and who does, who meets with the patient and their family um, during the visit to do that, that education or that training. Um, that's why I say nurses are just at, at the very center. They are the they are the heart of this work, I and mean, they are they are just so crucial um, in doing this work in the in the community health center. Uh, okay, there's another one, sir. Maybe be, this is about the first the first slide in the beginning. Uh, so the questions is from Ms. Ratno Lestari. It's about how to improve health equity in managing chronic disease. 
uh, because in our country it's such a complex issue. A lot of patients are living with a chronic disease, but they are also in poverty, unemployed, and poor education, and different beliefs with regards to the treatment that we provide. Uh, we provide. So, so this is a huge issue in our country here in the United States. Um, I. I would be uncomfortable in telling you that we, we have a solution for this because we don't. Um, health equity is a big problem in my country. Um, we have a lot of patients who, um, there are what we call structural barriers to care. Um, they live in poverty, they're unemployed, they don't have access to education. Um, they have different belief systems from their culture, um, from their religion, regarding their healthcare. Um, and I don't think we know. Um, it is such a complex issue that our country is struggling with this same issue a lot. Um, we have, as you know, a history of, of, of racism in this country. We have a history of slavery in this country. Um, that we, have a, we had a huge civil war on 150 years ago in this country. Um, and we're still struggling with this, this health equity issue. Um, I can tell you that um, there is more conversation about this now than there was even two or three years ago because of COVID, because of the coronavirus, um, because it, it it caused all these health equity issues to really be visible in our country um, when, when, we had, when we entered the, the coronavirus pandemic um, here in our country. Um, and so what I will say to you is that what we call our community health centers here in our country, the um, clinics that do this work, focus a lot of time and energy on forming relationships in their community with other agencies, other organizations, with their schools, with their fire department, with their police department, um, with, their, their, with their churches, with their, um, their mosques, with their synagogues, with their and they reach out to them and they say, you know, we are all in this together. Um, the biggest determinant of health of our patients is not whether we can prescribe the medicine. It's these conditions, the poverty, the food insecurity, the unemployment, the lack of education. And we are all in the same boat together in this. And some, fed some community health centers in our country have taken the lead role in their community of bringing those people together into the same room. So they will bring in the local director of the school district, the education, the police department, the fire department, the um, uh, social welfare department, and they'll sit down the table and they'll say, you know, we cannot take care of our patients with chronic diseases very well because of these conditions. How can we do a better job of linking these patients to resources that they need regarding work, poverty, you know, overcoming of poverty, education. Um, how can we work with you in the religious community about their beliefs regards to treatment? What can we do to what can we do to work together on this so that that the members of your community are not dying prematurely from these conditions? Because it does, it's not necessary for them to die at such an early age. There are treatments available if we can work together and figure out a way to support them and to incorporate their, their beliefs into this treatment plan. So it, it, it's a problem. I don't know the solution. I don't know the solution. I just know that it requires a lot of conversations. Okay, thank you, sir. Um, I think there's one from YouTube. Um, it's about uh, 
tobacco control program is there any such of example of how to uh, control this tobacco user in, in usa oh the tobacco control program yeah 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 yeah, yeah. um there 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 are um there are a number of tobacco control programs that have been established, but those are mostly in the public health, through the public health department. Um, and what we found is that, that if I work in a community health center, linking that patient to that tobacco cessation program was very difficult um, because that program was somewhere else. It was in the public health department. It wasn't in the community health center. So again, what has happened in our country is many community health centers have met with their local tobacco control program and said, we need a better way of linking our patients to you. We can't just give them information about this program and expect that they're gonna go home and call you for help because patients won't do that. We need a way to link them to you and to get them an appointment with you before they leave the clinic. How do we do that? And so they would work with their local public health tobacco control program so that before the patient left the clinic, there was someone in the clinic, usually a nurse. <laughs> nurses, run, nurses run the world. I don't know if you know that. Nurses are in charge. Um, usually a nurse who would say, okay, there's a referral here for you, to, for you to go to the tobacco control program. Your clinician has entered a referral into your medical record. I'm going to get you an appointment with that control program before you leave the clinic. Don't go anywhere. Sit down right here. And the nurse would go contact the tobacco control program, give them the patient's information, make the appointment, and go back to the patient and say, here, you're supposed to show up at this tobacco control program next Tuesday at 5 p.m. Here's the street address. Here's where there are. And oh, by the way, if you don't show up, they're going to call us and let us know you didn't show up. <laughs> so, so there had to be a linkage and there had to be a way to close the loop. There had to be a way to make sure that patients were following up because if they didn't, I need, in the community health center, I need to know that. So that if I, if I, if I can follow up with that patient, I can, I can do that. I can say, I can call them or I can talk to their family member and say, you know, we tried to get your father connected with the tobacco control program and he didn't show up. Can we help? How can we help? How can we, how, I know he's probably not ready yet, but how can we make him more ready to engage with us in, in tackling this, this tobacco control? Because we know it's gonna to contribute to his risk of having another stroke in the next five years or two years or one year. Um, it's very difficult. It's not easy. And it requires a lot, again, it requires a lot of conversations and tracking of patients. So, yeah. Um, how much time do we have left? I think I'm over time. Uh, that's all the question for now, sir. You may continue. Okay. okay. So another thing to think about is how do you measure the quality of your care transition program? Um, and there are some ways to track that, um, but such as how many times when a patient was discharged from the hospital was the community health center notified of the, or how many times when a patient was admitted to the hospital was the community health center notified that one of their patients was admitted to the hospital, right? So that's a way to, to, to measure is the acute care hospital doing their job. And you could measure that. You could say, hey, you're, you're the acute care hospital. You're supposed to notify us of when our patient is admitted to the hospital. You only did that for three out of the last 50 people who were admitted to the hospital. How can we help you do that better? 
So you can track that number. You can track how many of the times did the hospital notify the community health center, hopefully a nurse care manager of the hospital district. And you can go back to the care hospital and say, hey, we just discovered that only half of the patients that were discharged from the hospital did we ever receive any notification from you that our patient was discharged from the hospital. Um, it's another way to measure it. Now on the community health center side, there are ways you can measure quality of care there. So how many times was the patient's medication reviewed with the patient within 72 hours, usually over the phone, to make sure they know what medicines are sometimes in a home visit. The nurse will make a home visit. To make sure the patient knew what medicines they were supposed to be on and they were taking the right medicine. Oftentimes we'd see patients go home and they had their blood pressure medicine at home. They were sent home with a prescription for the same blood pressure medicine and they would be taking both medicines at the same time, not realizing that they only needed to take one of those, not both prescriptions. Um, how many times did the patient actually get a follow-up visit within seven days of discharge? Or how many times was the patient readmitted to the hospital within a month, within 30 days? So those are the kinds of things to think about. You could actually track these, these numbers and say, are we doing better? Are we doing better? How do we know if we're doing better in terms of managing care transitions from the acute hospital to the community health center? Um, I think we've talked about all of this. Um, there are some tools and resources available. And again, I'll, I'll fill in this slide with some additional tools and resources and links to tools and resources and share these with you. Um, there's, there's, there's a federal, federal government agency here in the United States called the Agency for Healthcare Research and Quality that has a whole website full of care transition tools and resources for you. Um, there are, I'll, I'll provide you with better links to Mary Naylor's program and to Eric Coleman's program on care transitions where you can access those tools and resources. But, but I just want you to begin thinking about what are the implications of this for nursing education? Um, what are the skill sets that nurses need to be able to work in this role as a care, nurse care manager for care transitions or in the acute care hospital? Um, and what are the research questions for you? in terms of nursing research or what kind of things, or what are the implications of this for community service in terms of improving the care in your community? Um, just some of my questions. And I'll just end by showing you two photos of where I live. Um, this, is, this, is, this is my home. Um, this is a river near my house. Um, and that's me and my wife out on a walk. We went hiking one day up in the mountains. Um, and you can see the snow on the mountain behind us. That is. Yes, that is a volcano, but it's not active, thank God, um, behind us. So we have volcanoes in my, in my, my, where I live here in Washington State as well. Um, so that's just a little bit about me. So um, that's all I've got. So let me stop sharing and see if there are any questions. Okay, well, <laughs> that's very insightful, Dr. Parkman, because, uh, as for now, we can see so many differences between uh, Indonesia and USA, but uh, we can make it as a progress. Uh, we know how to build our community center to be better. Uh, and maybe uh, we can adapt some of learning method, uh, how the nurses in the USA implemented those, uh, those program. Maybe it can raise our uh, healthcare quality in Indonesia. And somehow I do hope that it really helps us here. Uh, so for anyone of our audience who, uh, wants to ask some question, we still have time about um, 20 minutes. We have 20 minutes. If you still have a question, uh, you can say it directly to <laughs> Dr. Parkman or uh, if anyhow you want to type it down, I'll sure to read it to him. So please. Uh, my retina, I think I want to ask again a question. Uh, oh, please, Miss Effie. 
Thank you, Dr. Prashman. Uh, I love the picture. Uh, it makes me uh, miss hiking place in Oregon. Anyway, <laughs> uh, I uh, it's it's um it's very amazing presentation about the system that have worked in United States about uh, how you actually coordinate the care between hospital and the um, community center. Um, my question is, we, we have done that, we try to have that kind of system as well in Indonesia, but the problem is that we don't have that um, like financial, um, what do you call, financing arrangement? Mm -hmm. So my mm -hmm. question will be, uh, you have that uh, the teams that actually work for to coordinate those kind of uh, treatment or care between hospital and community. You have a team that call up the patients and have a home visit to their house. Um, how how they are paid? Uh, do the national insurance system have their arrangement, whether this is a reimbursement fee for service or DRG arrangement? Mm -hmm. uh, what kind of fin financing arrangement that you have for that mm -hmm. kind of program? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So there are two sources. There are two sources of financing for this arrangement um, here in the United States. What I mentioned is that the hospitals began developing their budgets to cover the cost of this because the hospitals were realizing that they were seeing the same patients over and over and over again with the same condition and the same problems because there was no follow-up and there was no care transition. And I can tell you that in some of the hospitals that I've worked in as a physician, it is very frustrating as a, as a physician to keep seeing the same patient come back in over and over with the same problem. Um, and it made me feel like it, it, was, it was sort of, it was, it was an exercise in futility to try to get the patient back, to, to provide the hospital care, to get, to get the patient back into the condition where they could go back home again, knowing the likelihood of them coming back in within the next month was very high because there was no care transition there was no planning for how they were gonna continue getting care after they left the hospital. So in many hospitals, the physicians and the nurses on the nurse, in the hospital floor, in some cases, they actually went to the hospital administration and said, we can't do this anymore. We cannot provide compassionate, quality care in our hospital because we are burning out. We are getting tired because we keep seeing the same patients over and over again with the same conditions because there is no care transition. There are, there's nobody here in our hospital who is given the job and the assignment and, and has no other responsibilities, right? Except for making sure that the patient is transitioned back out into the community health center and is getting the care they need so they don't end up back in the hospital again. So the hospital is one source of funding. And, and, and the hospital in our the hospitals in our country were losing money on these patients. I mean they were <laughs> it was it was not it was not it was not good financially for the hospital either. And so they said, oh, you're right. Okay. So let's hire some more nurses to do this. And the hospitals would hire nurses to be just nurse care, nurse transition, care transition managers. At the community health center level, um, the people who are covering the, the budgets for those community health centers, the payment of those community health centers, that same insurance plan was also paying for the hospital care for these patients. And so the insurance plan or the people paying for the care in the community health center was, was, was suddenly realizing 
if they provided additional funding to the community health center to hire a nurse to be a care manager, they would not have to spend so much money on the patient in the hospital either. So they began providing additional funding to the community health center with the expectation that they would have a nurse care manager who does care transition work. And in fact, in our country, in order to be eligible to receive funding as a community health center, you are required to have a nurse care manager in that role or your funding will be cut off. There was, there's no option in our country for, for many community health centers. Um, and you have to show that there is someone doing that and you have to have to provide their job description. So in order to be a, a qualified community health center in our country, you have to have someone who does that job. And they provided the money to do it, right? So the health center was given a budget that said, yes, here's the budget for you to hire a nurse to do this. All right, thank you, Doctor. You're welcome. Okay, there is another question. Maybe I'll read from the YouTube one, sir. Okay, the question is from uh, Mr. Diki. What should nurse manager do to track patient who don't keep follow up appointment? Is there any effective approach? Because uh, he made an example that in Indonesia, especially for AIDS patients from uh, rural area, uh, there's so many cases of loss to follow up. So they didn't come to follow up and that's it. In Indonesia, do you have um, community health workers? Yeah, sure. We have it here. And how, what is, what is the role of a community health worker in your country? What do they do? Uh, I'm sorry, sir, can you repeat? I'm sorry. Um, can you describe for me um, the community health worker in your country? Um, where, what, what work do they do? What kind of, um, what kind of activity do they do? What are they responsible for? What is the oh, role okay. of the community health center? The uh, community so, health uh, normally they, as I said before, normally they do some, uh, they do have a lot of program. Uh, one of, one of those program is, uh, to educate and Sometimes they, they also do some follow-up for the patient, but maybe it's from the patient, maybe because they don't want to continue uh, their medication program. That's, that's how they, they don't want to follow up. Uh, maybe because uh, as his example for AIDS, maybe because AIDS is uh, something that's not common in Indonesia. We have it mm -hmm. a lot here, but somehow, uh, the treatment is it's not really it's not really progressing. Maybe that's the reason why they don't want to follow up uh, their medication program. So maybe uh, that's of his question. Is there any effective approach uh, that USA nurses do uh, mm -hmm. to take care yeah. of this problem? Yeah. So so. Um... I'll, I'll tell you the story about one community health center in the United States is a very rural area. Um, and what they do is they have, um, they have a group of community health workers um, that are, that work for that community health center. There's a nurse who is their supervisor um, and they report to the nurse in the community health center. But the nurse's job is to um, have um, a, a list of, of these patients who are lost to follow up to figure out which community health worker is best located in terms of do they live in that community? Do, are they live in a community near that person who can go find that person and talk to them? 
Um, and then the nurse provides that community health worker with the information they need to be able to check on that patient to see, um, here's how you do, here's how you recognize their medications. These are what you look for. If you wanna check on their medications, the nurse teaches the community health worker how to do that medication check in the patient's home. So the community health worker visits the patient's home, um, do that medication check, and the visit with the patient and the family about their condition um, and to educate and help overcome stigma and beliefs about their condition, um, whether it be AIDS or whether it be congestive heart failure or diabetes or high blood pressure, um, and works with the family um, and the patient um, to try to connect them back so it's, you know, it's that relation, that personal relationship with a trusted member of the community. That community health worker hopefully is a trusted member of that community. They're from that community. They know that culture. They know that patient's belief systems. They are a part of that same culture. They are part of that same belief system. And does the patient trust them when the community health worker says, we can help you? But the nurse, is the one who supervises the team of community health workers who go out and do that work. Okay. Uh, can I explain it to my friend, sir? Okay. Um, jadi di sana itu, kalau ada orang yang nggak uh, bisa um, jadwalnya kontrol tapi nggak datang gitu, jadi ada satu orang yang yang hmm diutus langsung datang ke rumahnya gitu dan itu yang bisa di yang bisa dipercaya sama community community health centernya itu dan yang bisa kayak uh, apa bahasa jawanya uh, yang bisa istilahnya kayak uh, yang tahu personalnya yang tahu tentang budayanya yang tahu tentang uh, keluarganya gitu jadi dia juga melakukan pendekatan ke keluarganya untuk uh, menjelaskan kondisinya ini bagaimana dan perawatannya harus bagaimana gitu. Jadi dia sebelum berangkat ke sana uh, ada supervisor yang uh, istilahnya membantu untuk uh, gini nanti perawatan dan bagaimana cara pengobatan yang harus kamu lakukan setelah sampai di rumahnya gitu. Marina, can I add more points? Uh... Jadi kalau di US yang dimaksud community health worker itu kalau di kita namanya kader. Jadi kalau kader-kader itu kan berasal dari orang-orang di desa tersebut, dari komunitas tersebut gitu. Jadi tugasnya perawat itu memberikan pelatihan pada kader bagaimana memfollow up medikasi pada pasien di rumah. Dan mungkin kalau dengan kader itu mereka trustnya kan lebih trust ke kader daripada ke uh, pas ke perawatnya karena kader itu berasal dari orang biasa orang awam yang sudah tahu mungkin ya tetangganya dan ininya ya itu yang perlu di, 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 dipahami juga so Dr Michael we do have a community health workers here we call it kadre so it's from the neighborhood the per, the people or um uh, yeah the most most of them are female uh, But however, we at the moment we are focusing on um, mother and child, ma, yeah, mother and child health. So they are we are focusing on more monitoring that kind of uh, condition. Uh, but we are moving to the chronic disease uh, managing uh, patients in our community. But we yes we 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 admitted that we don't have that kind of training just yet for the chronic illness uh, how to monitor the medication in the community from nurses to the community health workers yes. you are still muted huh. that but yeah but I was just. In, in the United States, that's a common approach where we have community health workers who go out in the community to address chronic illness. Um, yeah. Uh, there's another one, sorry, uh, from yeah. Deswita. Yeah. This is my classmate. Uh, 
her question would be how we as a nurse educate and uh, practice from quality and safety of care transition from hospital to home in older patients. Maybe because older patients, uh, there's so many older patients who live alone, doesn't have family. Maybe, yeah. Yeah, that that's a problem here too. We have a lot of older patients who um, um, live alone um, and don't have any social support. And <clears throat> one of the things that we're learning how to do in, in our country is how to screen for those patients, how to identify them, because sometimes we're not aware that that's the case, especially the older patient. Um, so we've developed in the clinics where I work, in the health system where I work, we've developed a um, workflow in the clinic where at the visit, in addition to taking their blood pressure and checking their pulse and their vital signs, we also ask questions like, and do you live alone? It's part of the vital signs. So it's, a, it's called a social determinant of health. So living alone is a social determinant of health. If you live alone, we know your health is not gonna be as good as if when you live with a family. So it's a determinant of health, a social determinant of health. Um, as is things like food insecurity or homelessness where you're living in the streets. Um, and so <clears throat> we've developed a standard way of asking those questions at, at, at every visit with patients um, to make sure we don't miss that. And then, and then the issue becomes, how do you connect those people to a social support system? Um, now, in our country, because our country has such a large older population now, um, over the last 30 years, we've developed agencies for, for aging. It's called the Area Agency on Aging. So there are social agencies that do outreach to patients who live alone, um, and they connect them to what we call um, senior centers. It's a senior center. A senior center is a place where an older adult can go to play games with other older adults, to have coffee, to talk with people, to share what books they're reading, to, to, do, um, to do Tai Chi or to do activities, physical activities. Um, and so there's a social worker a person called a social worker who then connects that older adult who lives alone to that senior center where they can go and connect socially with other adults. And usually in the, in the senior center, there's oftentimes a visiting nurse in the senior center. So the senior center has a nurse who comes in on Tuesday mornings or on Wednesday afternoons. Um, and the, and the, people know that if they go on Tuesday morning or Wednesday afternoon, there'll be a nurse there that they can talk to. Um, and, and the nurse is there to take their blood pressure and their vital signs and to uh, talk with them about their medications and explain what their medications are and answer any of their questions. And, and, but, but it's taken us a long time in this country to develop. The, and there are a lot of communities that don't have that resource. Don't get me wrong. There are a lot of communities here in the United States that don't have a senior center. They don't have a resource for elder patients like that. Um, but, but we're trying to develop those resources here in our country, and we're trying to identify those, those patients and get them into, into a social interaction. Now, some of those patients are depressed, and that's the reason they stay home, is because they're depressed and they don't want to go out. So recognizing their depression is an important, treating their depression is an important part of the care plan. Um, and talking with them about depression is a real disease, just like kidney failure or heart disease or anything else. Uh, from your explanation, uh, I think Indonesia also uh, has those kind of programs. Some of our community health care uh, center has this program. So the nurses, um, there is a, a monthly checkup for the older patients. 
uh, and they manage that uh, to improve the interactions between older patients. So that's the time when the older patients have a chance to speak to their neighborhood. Maybe the reason why uh, they do that because uh, so many older patients are in the depression, that's right. They don't go out. So that's why uh, the nurses from the, from the healthcare uh, want to in, uh, initiate uh, that these older patients also need to interact with one and each other. I think we have the same. Maybe, maybe that's not perfect, but at least the, uh, we have it mm -hmm. here. Mm -hmm. yeah. um, okay. Is there anyone who wants to ask? Teman-teman masih ada kah yang mau tanya? Okay. It's 10 a.m. We are in the right time, so. Uh, so maybe because there's no question anymore. Uh, we thank Dr. Parkman for giving us such an, uh, this is really a good uh, experience. And this is also a good topic for us uh, because uh, my university uh, implemented chronic nursing is uh, the specialty of our, of our mm -hmm. faculty. So uh, we really thank you for giving us such an, a good insight and this is really help us to learn uh, a new topic and we will make sure to uh, to implement this one in our community as well um uh, anyway dr michael can we have your slide please is that okay yes. if uh, if we if you send it to miss effie's email how can i give her email to you I have her email. Oh, okay, that's perfect. I will send it. I will send it to Miss Eddie. Yes. Okay. Yes, yep. we, we communicate a lot. <laughs> oh, that's, that's perfect. Okay, so Miss Evie, uh, he will send the email to you because he already has your email. So I'll mm -hmm. give it back to Shafa. Thank you once again, Dr. Michael. Thank you. It's really an honor to know you in person. Thank you. It's a it's a great honor to be here. Thank you for the opportunity. All right, uh, what an excellent explanation from our lecturer, Dr. Michael Yeo Parkman, Doctor of Medicine, Master of Public Health. Thank you very much, Dr. Parkman. Also, thank you to our amazing Kak Marantina Grace for delivering today's lecture. Well, we have learned a lot this morning and sadly this lecture is about to end. I hope that all things we learned today will be useful not only for ourselves, but also for people around us. Maybe from Dr. Yati, want to deliver some words before it ends? Okay, thank you, Safa. Uh, I would like to say thank you very much, Dr. Michael, for your time uh, to share your knowledge and experience. Um, I think it's uh, our responsibility as nurses Indonesia. Uh, we have to collaborate with another profession maybe with government, uh, maybe with a private organization or another partner. And uh, overall, we can see it's uh, so complicated maybe. <laughs> but I think uh, it is uh, for us, uh, we accept all of this as a challenge, challenge challenges uh, for us. Uh, uh, I think there is, no, uh, there is nothing impossible if we try and working together. <laughs> I hope someday we can have a, a national health system like in the America and people can get uh, the best, uh, excellent uh, service from nurses. I think that's, uh, we can say to uh, thank you to uh, Dr. Michael and I hope we can meet in another occasion. Uh, stay healthy and safe, Dr. Michael. Uh, thank you very much. Thank you very much. Okay, so before it ends, maybe for all participants, please fill the attendance link that have been sent in the chat room section.
So before it ends, uh, we can pray together first. Pray begin. Amen. Please forgive me for my mistakes while bringing this quiz lecture. Thank you for your attention. May all of you have a great day. See you next time. Stay healthy and stay safe. Thank you very much all. Thank you, Dr. Michael, for amazing presentation as usual. I'll see you again on uh, September 8th.